Right, so this is the boiler room control panel at Elthorn Park Primary School and I'm going to be giving you an overview of the control panel functions. Um, I'm going to start by giving you a panel overview of the power section and what these lamps and labels and switches mean and then uh, we'll go through a bit more detail in the intelligent side of the control when we go through the control section in the IQ View 8. So, first of all, these are the conventional panel labels that you'll see on many of the other control panels. These are our standard uh, formatted labels. And the first label you'll see on the top, hand, top left hand corner is the panel status. This is probably the most, one of the most important labels because it's, it gives you three very important indications. The first light is the control circuit live lamp. Now that should always be lit. If that isn't lit, then the chances are that you've got uh, a control circuit for it. Um, and, the, and the control circuit is the 24 volt control circuit that serves the entire circuitry within inside this control panel. So if that light is out, chances are you're not going to have any plant running. Okay, there is a lamp test facility. The button's located on this label as well. Uh, and that will test the operation of all the LEDs. They are LEDs, they have about 10,000 hours of life in them from new, uh, so they're very cost effective to replace as well and they should last a long time. So you can use the lamp test button. If this lamp is, uh, doesn't light up when you press the lamp test button, then the chances are the lamp's gone, but it's very unlikely. So chances are if that lights out, you can have a problem. The second lamp on the label is the gas detection alarm. So there's a, a gas sniffer above the boilers up there, a little black box, and that detects the gas in the air. And if the gas goes above the preset level, that will shut off the plant. That will shut down your gas solenoid, which I'll come on to in a minute. And the, the, the last lamp on the, la on the label is the fire alarm detected. So there's a fire interface just above the panel there where the red, the red cable, this red cable goes into, that is the fire alarm relay box and this control panel just monitors a volt, a volt free contact in that fire alarm relay box. It's a normally closed contact, it's wired into the first two terminals in the, on the left hand side in the panel and if that circuit breaks that will also shut the plant down. Now what happens is uh, we're going to move on to the gas, <clears throat> these are all the life safety systems, we're going to move on to the gas solenoid valve um, which will relate to these safety systems because if any of these safety systems are ruptured then the gas valve will close. Now on top of that there are, there's a thermal link above the boiler which will, is a small little piece of lead and that will break when, uh, when it gets too hot so if there's a fire it will melt the link and that is wired in series with an emergency stop button at the entrance or the exit of the boiler room there. That is one continuous circuit and if that circuit breaks then we, uh, we, we're going to shut the plant down but what happens is if any of these life safety systems are ruptured your gas valve will close. Now your gas valve is on, is over there, the, uh, the black valve on the yellow pipe work there and uh, that will close to stop gas coming into the plant room. So if you've got a fire gas leak or someone's hit the knockoff button or you've got a fire uh, heat melting the link above the boiler we're going to shut the gas off last thing we want to do is bring more gas into the building so we shut the gas off and what will happen is you'll get a closed light lit the open light will go out and you'll also have a gas safety circuit failed light lit as well the whole time there's a fault, you're going to have a gas safety circuit failed light. Now, what will happen is once you rectify the problem, so if you reset the gas solen uh, reset the knockoff button, or you uh, or the fire the fire system's healthy again, this light, this gas safety circuit failed light, will go out to let you know that the problem's been rectified. But the closed light will stay lit until you've pressed the reset. So you've said, I'm happy to press the reset, I'm gonna reset the gas valve. And then the gas valve, as long as all of those safety circuits are healthy, the gas valve will come back on. Um, moving on from that, there is another label work which monitors the pressurization unit. Now the pressurization unit is another safety circuit, it's a hardwired safety circuit. There's a pressurization unit over on the wall there and what we do is we monitor the high and low levels of pressure uh, determined by that unit. Now if the, if the system goes high pressure or low pressure then uh, we're going we're gonna to momentarily hold the pumps off. If you've got a leak somewhere or radiators come off the wall or you've got uh, a, a pump 
that's got a leak. Last thing we want to do, once that pressure drops, the last thing we want to do is continue to run the pump. So this panel will monitor only, it will monitor only the pressurization unit, has no control over it, but it monitors it, and if it goes into high or low pressure, then it will shut the pumps down and the boilers as well. Uh, last thing we want if there's no water in the system is to run the boilers, okay? So that's the pressurization unit. Moving on from that is just a miscellaneous plant monitoring alarm label, which is for the overdoor heaters. Uh, there's a couple of overdoor heaters and we just monitor the fault from here. We don't control the heaters, but we just uh, monitor the fault on there. Okay, so moving on to the pumps. Uh, it's a very simple system. You've got one set of constant temperature heating pumps that serve all of the systems, so the radiant panels, the air handling units, um, and it's a twin set of pumps. So why there's two is, although only one pump should ever be running at any one time, when there's a heating demand, the duty pump will be initiated. So every Monday morning, we change, we change duty. So Monday morning, pump one will be the lead. Next Monday morning, pump two will be the lead, and it will change over on a weekly basis. But once the duty pump is enabled, once there's a heating demand from either the radiant panels or the air handling units, the, the control panel will monitor flow across the pump set via that differential pressure switch that's piped up across the pumps. What we do is we monitor that for 60 seconds to say, we've enabled the pump, is there flow? And if there isn't flow in 60 seconds, then we cancel the pump, we disable the pump, and we start, we automatically bring on the standby pump. Uh, and what will happen is we'll raise an alarm on the pump that had the flow failure, and you'll be able to access the alarms, and, and, and you'll need to reset the pump once you've rectified the fault. Okay, but that changes over on a weekly basis. Um, and then we've got the gas-fired water heater, which uh, has its own uh, temperature control. So via the little stat and programmer on the heater, you'll be able to set the temperatures. We do enable the thing from here. We enable the heater from uh, this panel under separate time switch control. Okay, and then once that's enabled, we monitor it for a lockout indication. Okay, um, and then the HWS secondary pump again is enabled on time switch control. It's only one single pump. Uh, once it's once it's um, enabled, then we monitor it for a trip uh, a trip status. So, if any of these lights, these green lights, are on, that means the plant is running or enabled to run. And if any of the red lights are lit, you know there's a full a lockout or a tr electrical trip. Okay, and then you'll need to investigate further or give us a call. So moving on to the boilers, just like the pumps, there's, 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 uh, there's three modules there, the, the three boiler modules. Just like the pumps they are, the duty is rotated on a weekly basis. The only difference is, is the boiler's load share as well. So although Monday morning boiler one may be the lead, we see uh, boiler one come on, and if the demand is too great, for one boiler module to cope with, then it may bring on boiler two to help top up the temperature to the set point of uh, 70 degree return. Okay, so we work to the return on those because it's a far more efficient way of controlling the boilers. The boilers are sequenced in order to maintain a uh, return temperature of 70 degrees. Uh, again, that's adjustable uh, via the head end or the display, which we'll go through in just a minute. And then the last, uh, the last label on the panel is the AC units. From here, we're monitoring uh, the AC units in the server room and comms room, just for a fault indication only. Again, we have no control over those units, we're just monitoring them for a fault. Now, if you was to come in, there's three levels of, of frost protection. Um, if the outside air drops below uh, zero degrees, we run the pumps and we, um, we circulate the pumps to stop a frost in the pipework. The second stage is we monitor the immersion sensors, all the temperature sensors in here, and if that drops below 12 degrees, we run the pumps as well, just to uh, circulate the water. And if that continues to drop, we then bring on the boilers just to elevate the temperature above 21 degrees. Okay, and then the last stage of frost protection is fabric frost. We've got numerous temperature sensors located in the space, and uh, we'll monitor those, and if it drops below 16, we'll bring on the pumps and the boilers just to elevate the temperature in the space because we don't want to damage things like plaster, paint, 
and all the fabric in there. So uh, if you ever come in and the plant's running and you think the time zone's off, it, it, chances are it's because it's freezing cold or it's cold outside and you've got a frost, frost activating. And uh, it would let you know on the BMS if a frost, frost condition has been activated. Okay, so that's really um, everything there is to know about the panel overview. The switches on the door, we've got three positions, hand off auto. Hand is continuously run, but respecting the safety circuits that I mentioned earlier. Off is off, and auto is all of the sa respecting all the safety circuits and uh, enabling the plant under the dictates of the time switch control, the optimization, which I'm gonna go through in a bit. Now, the optimization is a way of intelligently bringing on the plant um, with enough time to get to set point before the start of occupancy. So what that means is if you've got a time switch set eight till six, um, what the system will do, it will, it will look at the outside air temperature and look at the internal temperature and say, well, I need to come on a certain amount of time before the start of occupancy in order to be up to temperature for the start of occupancy. So it's an intelligent learning process that, that is continuously happening in the background throughout the year. Okay, so that's really all there is to say about uh, the panel section, the power section. One last thing is the isolator. This is the mains isolation switch down here and uh, you'll need to turn that off to open the door. However, there is an engineer's switch underneath that will allow you to open the door whilst the panel is still powered. We don't recommend you do this and we recommend that you call one of us or an expert or someone competent enough to know what they're doing inside the control panel. All right, so this is the power section, which I just went over. I just want to show you inside to show you what it looks like. Uh, you have your incoming terminals up here, uh, a bank of relays, which do all the monitoring. And then we've got the power section, which has the, the MCBs, which just look like what you would have in your house. And uh, these are manual motor starters, which start the pumps and any motors on the system. Down here, you have the transformer and the control circuit MCBs and fuses down here. So if the control circuit live lamp has gone out, that'll be because MCB uh, 2C has tripped. Okay, and then obviously we have a mains incoming isolator here which will shut the panel down. All right, so moving on to the control section. This is the intelligent brains behind all of the control that we're going to be going over. This is a Trend IQ4. It's the latest technology from Trend, who are the UK's leading controls manufacturer. And again, terminals up the top, control, sec control section controller with the base module and all of the I.O. modules as well. This is a web-based controller. It's able to be linked into your uh, network. If you was to provide an ethernet point up there, you could just plug it in and you'd be able to pull up a web page that will give you all of this, the display and the settings and all the temperature values and everything we can access through the IQ View 8. All right, and then down here we've got uh, an ethernet switch where you can plug in that network cable. And then there's a socket down in the bottom right hand corner. That socket should only be used for a laptop by an en from an engineer, an engineer's laptop only. Don't we, you mustn't plug in things like lights, transformers or anything else into that socket. All right, so this is the roof control panel at Elfhorn Park School and this is responsible for all of the air handling plant up here on the roof. Now. I'm not going to go through every single one because there's 11 handling, air handling units here and they all have the same function apart from 8, 9 and 10 which is slightly different which I'll go through. Um, but essentially you've got the same panel status live lamp up here which tells you whether the control circuit's healthy and you've also got a fire alarm active indication up there as well. So if the fire alarm light is lit then all of your plant will be shut down. Um, and then moving on from that, you've got all of the air handling units. So there's 11 air handling units, 10 of which are supply and extract, and then number 11 is supply only. Now there's also four toilet extract fans which serve different toilets around the building. And those units are twin units, which I'll explain as we go down. So first of all, I'm gonna go through the basic operation of an air handling unit. Now, the air handling unit will be enabled um, once it's enabled, there'll be an inlet and outlet damper motor on a set of blades on each air handling unit, which will begin to open. Once those dampers are open, there's a little switch that makes and tells this that I've now got an air path, 
we can now start the fans. So then only then will we start the fans. Now once the fans are started, we monitor a differential pressure switch across the fans, just like we do on the pumps, to determine whether there's flow established across the fan. Now all being well, if flow is established, then great, the fan will continue to run and then we'll go into uh, tempered air mode, which I'll explain. But if, there, if the flow isn't established and detected, then we'll fail the fan and an alarm will be raised on the BMS. Okay, now once the fan is healthy and it begins to run, um, then we start to temper the air. So the temperature from the CT circuit fed from the boilers will serve each free port valve on each air handling unit and uh, the heat will be there ready to use should the air handling need it. But before it uses that, it uses something called a thermal wheel. What it does is it uses the thermal wheel, the heat transfer from the thermal wheel to bring heat transfer from the extract of the building and, and it will use it so that the supply air crosses that heat transfer and heats up the supply air without having to use your boilers. So it's a very efficient way of heating your, your space without using any gas or, or, or any of your boilers. Okay, um, it will do that. The set point's been defe defaulted to 21 degrees. That's adjustable via the head end or the BMS display panel. Um, and what happens is if it can't cope with 21 degrees, so if it's a cold day and it quite, can't quite get to 21 using just the thermal wheel, then it will initiate the three port valve just to use some of the hot water from the temperature, the constant temperature circuit fed from the boilers just to top that up to get to 21. And what you'll see is there's a three port valve on each unit and that just modulates to allow um, little or more water in depending on how much it needs to get to set point. Okay, now there's a few lamps. Uh, the green lamps are all enabled or running and the red lights are fault. Okay, now the middle red light on each of these labels is a flow failed lamp. What will happen is, when I said that the fan is enabled and then the damper starts to open, until the fan's running and that differential pressure switch is made, that light will be lit to let you know the flow has failed at the moment. Okay, so it might take a while for those two, for the fan to ramp up and then the, uh, and then the light to go out. Now if we move over to this section here, this section is just for monitoring and this is where we monitor all of the frost alarms and the filter alarms. Now the only thing that will stop the fans running if there's, uh, if there's, no, if there's no other safety circuits uh, activated or in fault, the only other thing that will stop the air handling units running is a frost stat. Okay, so there's on each of the air handling units there's a hardwired capillary frost stat, which is a, is a hardwired safety circuit to stop the fan running. It won't allow the dampers to open if that is activated. The frost stats are all set to five degrees, and if the temperature goes below five degrees, it's saying, well, the thermal wheel must be uh, broken or in fault. The boilers aren't giving me the heat I need, so I better shut down, otherwise I'm going to risk freezing and cracking my coil, and then we. Don't, we'll get all sorts of floods. So if any of these blue lights are lit, that means there's a frost active. And if any of the uh, yellow lights are lit, that means that there's a filter dirty. Now the filters will have to be replaced on a regular basis. And the chances are you'll be replacing them as part of your PPM before these lights come on. Now the reason I said that units eight, nine and 10 were slightly different is because they've got a DX coil built into them that's part of the AC system. And these units can be used for heating or cooling. So the set point of 21 degrees uh, will be used to maintain the temperature of the supply and uh, if it's hot outside and you need some additional cooling then these units are able to cool. Now the toilet extract fans, there's four of them, uh, they're enabled on their own time switch and once they're enabled they r run under the dictates of their own little smart controller. There's an eco smart controller in each of them and they'll do their own duty changeover if there's no flow established across the duty fan. The BMS does not do the duty changeover of the toilet fans. Um, so if you've got a problem with the, uh, if a fault comes up on one of the toilet extract fans, you'll need to go to the unit that's showing a fault and press the reset button on the EcoSmart controller.